Lauren Baeza, it's an incredible pleasure to meet with you. I'm sorry that we can't do this inside of the High Museum where you are the curator for African art. It's such a magnificent space and such an incredible place, but we're confined um, because of the virus. And it, in some way is one of the reasons why we're sitting here together uh, today is because we were thinking that for La Nuit des Idées, sponsored by the French government, the consulate, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about masks. So first of all, it's an incredible pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. So we were thinking about themes for this year. Masks are ubiquitous. Uh, they are separating us. Um, but we also happened to have gone through Halloween where one of my favorite holidays of the year where you, you put on a mask and maybe you become somebody that's closer to your, your authentic self. Um, <laughs> who knows? Who knows the many effects of masks? Um, and I happen to teach a course uh, every now and again on medieval masks and the ways in which they reflect a history of masking, maybe going right back to the Paleolithic era when people would wear animal masks uh, to facilitate hunting. So masks have been all over the place and you're, the museum with which you're now uh, affiliated has such an incredible collection of masks and uh, uh, including masks from Sub-Saharan Africa. I, I, I would love for you to give your sense of masks and their relationship to the African continent, their relationship to your work, and their relationship also to your approach to social justice, which is fascinating, this art, social justice overlap. Yeah, I mean, as you said, uh, masks have existed for probably about 40,000 years. Um, they are in every region inhabited by human beings. Um, and they have served several purposes. Um, I think, you know, probably some of the primary purposes they served have been, you know, as protection. Um, so we think about protective gear um, that maybe knights had during the medieval times and things of that nature and, and masks as protection in uh, medical situations or space helmets. Um, they've also been used in ritual performance um, as well as in entertainment. Um, and in each of these instances, uh, what I think is really interesting about masks is that they transform the wearer. In the case of protection, uh, such as some of those examples I just mentioned, um, they help us transcend sort of the limitations of our human condition. Um, and in African art collections, we find masks used uh, primarily in rites of passage, um, in celebratory festivals, um, and we, we also find them uh, for military purposes, which is kind of on par with how they're used <laughs> globally uh, over time. And in many cases in African art, you also find masks that um, are not intended to be adorned, um, but are used for sort of shrines, I'll say, and, and so forth. So they're representative of or literally embodying spirits or ancestors, and they are just placed somewhere to, for that purpose. Um, to be honored. Um, and today I want to talk about sort of another uh, type of mask that's found in African art collections around the world, uh, which are also not intended for a wearer. <laughs> uh, and that is um, art that was made for, cons I mean, masks that were made for consumption. Um, so these are not just not intended to be worn, but also uh, don't really have a spiritual or cultural function. Um, I think this is really uh, important to bring up because in the conversations around uh, so-called traditional African art, um, there's sort of polarizing language that tend is, tends to be used. Um, and that is you have authenticity or the authentic on one side, and then the other you have sort of imitations or fakes or so-called tourism art um, or so-called souvenir art. And those, um, <laughs> those are all considered less desirable. Um, and I think it's really uh, important to sort of meaningfully interrogate those kinds of categorizations um, because, especially because, you know, the quote unquote authentic is given prestige and preference. Um, and, it, and that's because it comes with these ideas of uh, untouched um, sort of, uh, uninfluenced by the West. 
um, when in fact, <laughs> a lot of the items in African collections and museums, but also in private collections, corporate collections, um, were always created with, the, with a buyer in mind, a Western buyer in mind. Um, and so when you think about, um, especially, but from the beginning of colonialism, but especially from mid to late colonial era, um, there's a great deal of documentation of um, African craftsmen, woodworkers, and blacksmiths creating things intending to sell them. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting opportunity to talk about um, African entrepreneurship um, and ways of navigating oppressive colonialism, um, this ingenuity, this um, sort of organic <laughs> market research wherein you know the craftspeople saw that there was a preference and that preference tended to be masks, especially wooden figurative masks that looked like a human face and began to mass produce those. We say mass produce now when we mean industrial, um, but in the context of the time, of course it wasn't machinery, but nonetheless, they were mass produced with the intention of just being bought and, and used decoratively in much the way that we call modern art that's made for the same purpose, sort of souvenir art, um, it's, it's the equivalent. I love it <laughs> because I think in the study of uh, African art, one often makes reference to, for example, the ways in which Europeans would go and find primitive work that somehow touched them more deeply. This whole concept of primitivism, which favors uh, artifacts from the, the continent as though in their presence they could touch something more deep inside of their own brains. You know, this, this kind of privileging of the archetype, the archetype, the symbol, the mask, the, uh, it, what it may from these, these, you know, sources that are more profound and deep and more historically rich uh, than the European world. So you're, you're talking about uh, authentic, there's, and, and I think Europeans have thought about this in terms of getting into connection with the, their authentic self. But now you're really troubling this. You're really, if these things were actually produced, this is a, it's a version of Orientalism that Saeed described. These were produced for the gaze, and it's the gaze that sends back the order, as it were. Yes. That's a mind-boggling concept. Yeah, and then it's interesting because sometimes I, I, I've read um, research or I've heard people interpret um, this sort of mass production of a, of a type of work, like these wood car figurative wood carvings and, and figurative uh, uh, masks as being a sort of preference of the people that, that made them or the uh, culture or ethnic group that they represent, when in fact, they were actually, it's not, it's not a reflection of a priority or a thing that they like the most. It's actually them responding to a market for this very particular type of aesthetic. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, the objects aren't um, representative or uh, in accord with uh, meaningful spiritual masks and, and sometimes are exact duplicates of a spiritual mask. Although not usually, there's usually small differences that only, um, the people of that community can, can discern. Um, but there are sometimes, you know, almost exact duplicates. The difference is just that they, in, in the meaning that we uh, place on objects, I think is um, sort of based on this assumption that it was used for a purpose. Right. And I think it's important to say, actually it's, uh, many of these things that are in our collections were never used for these purposes. They were meant to be bought and taken to Europe and mounted on a wall. And they were just meant to be appreciated for their aesthetic value. And so when I say this, when I make this critique, it's never to say the work on your wall or the work in these collections or the things that are selling upwards $5 million at the most prestigious auction houses in, in, in Europe um, aren't valuable. They're just souvenir art. It's actually to sort of challenge what we consider souvenir art and how we're applying those values. And it's also to primarily for me, to take a moment to say that there is aesthetic value in these objects that we consider um, not contemporary, or um, as, you, as you said, this, this notion of primitivism. I think we're just about done using that term, but it still shows up. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, people were buying this, this idea that, uh, that an artist creates something for an audience is something that contemporary artists do all the time. 
And so I think moving that timeline back to the colonial era is important, that people valued this craftsmanship, that the work made them feel something powerful. As you said, make, you know, they're trying to connect to something that they still connected to it, even if it wasn't something that was used in a spiritual ceremony, the yeah. work was valuable because the work is beautiful. And, you know, thousands years long tradition has been passed down and expertly executed by these artists and craftsmen. And so you're hanging it in your house because it's beautiful. I'm sure there are elements of exoticizing uh, a group of people and there's an overrepresentation of a certain type of our part of, of the lifestyle of those people when you're only buying the same couple of types of artifacts every time. But um, there's still something interesting there, I think, with regard to it being valuable for its aesthetic. And we don't need to necessarily try to falsely attribute it to some sort of authentic use. Right. Yeah, I think there's this kind of dream of, uh, of an incantation it being an original work that relates to some ceremony that's deeply mm -hmm. rooted. If you could just possess it, that somehow you could have access to different types of knowledge. And in fact, different types of knowledge seems to be an area that has, has run all the way through your own work. You're interested in art as a purveyor of different types of knowledge, that we have the statistical, we have the big data, we have the social, we have the, the political, we have what's out there, but then we have the the artistic whatever the aesthetic the, the ceremonial the, the all of these other dimensions and it seems that in your work as you've moved from human rights to art that in fact you you do it quite seamlessly because in in some ways they're they're defined realms in other ways they're so deeply intertwined is that fair yeah absolutely i don't think there's a way to <laughs> engage in African art collection in, our, in the period of time that we're in now with all of this interest in repatriation, with interest in decolonizing museums, with uh, the sort of the, the willingness for people to actually engage the uh, colonial history of museums, the colonial history of fields of study like anthropology and geography. Um, that conversation is happening now um, around these kinds of artifacts and the meaning made of them and how they were acquired and everything else. Mm -hmm. and that is all very political and it all relates to um, sort of social justice work. Yeah. Um, and, and important questions about people and, and representation. I think, again, uh, we kind of hinted at this, but it probably bears repeating this idea of what is thought of as African actually being an African response to what Europeans wanted right. is really interesting thing to unpack. And that is a, that has social justice implications because of the age of colonialism and the way that they were engaging with, the way that the people who created this work were engaging with the colonial power structure and trying to survive it and maneuver within the cash economy and make a way for themselves despite um, um, this oppressive system that lasted for hundreds of years. Um, those kinds of questions are, are political questions. Um, and so there's no real way to start to sort of peel back the layers and look at things like provenance and um, ways to interpret meaning from these artifacts without engaging these social and political processes um, and their and their ram and the you know the ramifications of them their modern day sort of um, manifestations of those power structures which continue and in the streets because of late in Atlanta and around America this this refusal to be characterized in the way that the, the, the characterizer is, 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 is insisting that in, in a sense, taking back your, your authenticity means also to refuse the false characterization that's being imposed upon you mm -hmm. by the ruling structure. So one of the many powers of the museum, it seems to me, is to, to give people access to your, the, the work that you're curating it's so as to connect to their own efforts and their own lives in the streets. Yes, if we, for me, if I am sort of motivated by um, uncovering the truth and sharing that truth with the public, that benefits everyone. Um, if, if, if Europeans have more of a truth, um, even though I'm coming to it obviously from my area of expertise, which is African art, um, then they know that much more about their own um, background and can make some interesting uh, inquiries. Um, the truth is in service to everything, is, is my point. And so um, 
that is a very simply put way um, to describe my practice. Um, trying to sort through it, what is quote unquote African in the first place, what is quote unquote authentic or traditional, um, who is a, who is assigning th these types of values, um, and why were things created, um, all of those kinds of questions and really meaningfully looking for the truth instead of um, projecting assumptions or simply sort of repeating the things that I've studied that were sometimes problematic uh, and from different eras. Sometimes we have to go back and redo the research. Um, and that's, that's how I'm motivated. Well, that is some of the most profound insights that I can think of as we can go on from Max. Max, definition <laughs> in depth. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure and honor to meet Thanks you. Thanks so much, Robert. This is fun. I really your work. <laughs>